Next Door by Kurt Vonnegut The old house was divided into two dwellings by a thin wall that passed on with high fidelity sounds on either side. On the north side were the Leonards, on the south side were the Hoggers. The Leonards, husband, wife and eight-year-old son, had just moved in, and, aware of the wall, they kept their voices down as they argued in a friendly way as to whether or not the boy, Paul, was old enough to be left alone for the evening. Shh said paul's father was i shouting said his mother i was talking in a perfectly normal tone if i could hear hager pulling a cork he can certainly hear you said his father i didn't say anything i'd be ashamed to have anybody hear said mrs leonard you called paul a baby said mr leonard that certainly embarrasses paul and it embarrasses me it's just a way of talking she said it's a way we've got to stop he said and we can stop treating him like a baby too tonight we simply shake his hand walk out and go to the movie he turned to paul you're not afraid are you boy i'll be all right said paul he was very tall for his age and thin and had a soft sleepy radiant sweetness engendered by his mother i'm fine damn right said his father clouting him on the back it'll be an adventure i'd feel better about this adventure if we could get a sitter said his mother if it's going to spoil the picture for you said the father let's take him with us mrs leonard was shocked Who? Oh, it isn't for children i don't care said paul amiably the why of they not wanting him to see certain movies certain magazines certain books certain television shows was a mystery he respected even relished a little it wouldn't kill him to see it said father you know what it's about she said what is it about said paul innocently mrs leonard looked to her husband for help and got none it's about a girl who chooses her friends unwisely she said oh said paul that doesn't sound very interesting are we going or aren't we said mr leonard impatiently the show starts in ten minutes mrs leonard bit her lip all right she said bravely you lock the windows in the back door and i'll write down the telephone numbers for the police and the fire department and the theater and dr failey she turned to paul you can dial can't you dear he's been dialing for years cried mr leonard said mrs leonard sorry mr leonard bowed to the wall my apologies paul dear said mrs leonard what are you going to do while we're gone oh look through my microscope i guess said paul you're not going to be looking at germs are you she said nope just hair sugar pepper stuff like that said paul his mother frowned judiciously i think that would be all right don't you she said to mr leonard fine said mr leonard just as long as the paper doesn't make him sneeze i'll be careful said paul mr leonard winced shh he said soon after paul's parents left the radio in the hager apartment went on it was on softly at first so softly that paul looking through his microscope on the living room coffee table couldn't make out the announcer's words the music was frail and dissonant unidentifiable gamely paul tried to listen to the music rather than to the man and woman who were fighting paul squinted through the eyepiece of his microscope at a bit of his hair far below and he turned a knob to bring the hair into focus it looked like a glistening brown eel flecked here and there with tiny spectra where the light struck the hair just so there the voices of the man and woman were getting louder again drowning out the radio paul twisted the microscope knob nervously and the objective lens ground into the glass slide on which the hair rested the woman was shouting now paul unscrewed the lens and examined it for damage now the man shouted back shouted something awful unbelievable paul got a sheet of lens tissue from his bedroom and dusted at the frosted dot on the lens where the lens had bitten into the slide he screwed the lens back in place all was quiet again next door except for the radio paul looked down into the microscope down into the milky mist of the damaged lens now the fight was beginning again louder and louder cruel and crazy trembling paul sprinkled grains of salt on a fresh slide and put it under the microscope the woman shouted again a high ragged poisonous shout paul turned the knob too hard and the fresh slide cracked 
and fell in triangles to the floor paul stood shaking wanting to shout too to shout in terror and bewilderment it had to stop whatever it was it had to stop if you're going to yell turn up the radio the man cried paul heard the clicking of the woman's heels across the floor the radio volume swelled until the boom of the bass made paul feel like he was trapped in a drum and now bellowed the radio for katie from fred for nancy from bob who thinks she's swell for arthur from one who's worshipped him from afar for six weeks here's stardust remember if you have a dedication call milton nine three thousand ask for all night sam the record man the music picked up the house and shook it a door slammed next door now someone hammered on a door paul looked down into his microscope once more looked at nothing while a prickling sensation spread over his skin he faced the truth the man and woman would kill each other if he didn't stop them he beat on the wall with his fist mr hogger stop it he cried mrs hogger stop it for ollie from lavinia all night sam cried back at him for ruth from Carl, who'll never forget last tuesday for wilbur from marv who's lonesome tonight here's the salter finnegan band asking love what are you doing to my heart next door crockery smashed filling a split second of radio silence and then the tidal wave of music drowned everything again paul stood by the wall trembling in his helplessness mr hogger mrs hogger please remember the number said all night sam milton nine three thousand dazed paul went to the phone and dialed the number wjcd said the switchboard operator w would you kindly connect me with all night sam said paul hello said all night sam he was eating talking with a full mouth in the background paul could hear sweet bleating music the original of what was rending the radio next door i wonder if i might make a dedication said paul don't know why not said sam ever belong to any organization listed as subversive by the attorney general's office paul thought a moment no sir i don't think so sir he said shoot said sam from mr lemuel k hager to mrs hager said paul and what's the message said sam I, I love you said paul let's make up and start all over again the woman's voice was so shrill with passion that it cut through the din of the radio and even sam heard it kid are you in trouble said sam your folks fighting paul was afraid that sam would hang up on him if he found out that paul wasn't a blood relative of the hoggers yes sir he said and you're trying to pull him back together again with this dedication said sam yes sir said paul sam became very emotional okay kid he said hoarsely i'll give it everything i've got maybe it'll work i once saved a guy from shooting himself the same way how did you do that said paul fascinated he called up and said he was gonna blow his brains out said sam and i played the bluebird of happiness he hung up paul dropped the telephone into its cradle the music stopped and paul's hair stood on end for the first time the fantastic speed of modern communications was real to him and he was appalled folks said sam i guess everybody stops and wonders sometimes what the heck he thinks he's doing with a life the good lord gave him it may seem funny to you folks because i always keep a cheerful front no matter how i feel inside that i wonder sometimes too and then just like some angel was trying to tell me keep going sam keep going something like this comes along folks said sam i've been asked to bring a man and his wife back together again through the miracle of radio i guess there's no sense in kidding ourselves about marriage it isn't any bowl of cherries there's ups and downs and sometimes folks don't see how they can go on paul was impressed with the wisdom and authority of sam having the radio turned up high made sense now for sam was speaking like the right hand man of god when sam paused for effect all was still next door already the miracle was working now said sam a guy in my business has to be half musician half philosopher half psychiatrist and half electrical engineer and if i've learned one thing from working with all you wonderful people out there it's this if folks would swallow their self-respect and pride there wouldn't be any more divorces they were affectionate cooing from next door a lump grew in paul's throat as he thought about the beautiful thing he and sam were bringing to pass folks said sam that's all i'm gonna say about love and marriage that's all anybody needs to know and now for mrs lemuel k hogger from mr hogger i love you let's make up and start all over again sam choked up here's eartha kit
And somebody bad stole the wedding bell. The radio next door went off. The world lay still. A purple emotion flooded Paul's being. Childhood dropped away and he hung dizzy on the brink of life. Rich, violent, rewarding. There was movement next door. Slow, foot-dragging movement. So, said the woman. Charlotte, said the man uneasily. Honey, I swear I love you, she said bitterly. Let's make up and start over again. Baby, said the man desperately. It's another Lemuel K. Hager. It's got to be. You want your wife back, she said. All right, I won't get in her way. She can have you, Lemuel, you jewel beyond price, you. She must have called the station, said the man. She can have you, you philandering, two-timing, two-bit Lochinvar, she said. But you won't be in very good condition. Charlotte, put that gun down, said the man. Don't do anything you'll be sorry for. Oh, that's all behind me, you worm, she said. There were three shots. Paul ran out into the hall and bumped into the woman as she burst from the Hager apartment. She was a big blonde woman, all soft and awry, like an unmade bed. She and Paul screamed at the same time, and then she grabbed him as he started to run. You want candy? she said wildly. Bicycle? No, thank you, said Paul shrilly. Not at this time. You haven't seen or heard a thing, she said. You know what happens to squealers? Yes, cried Paul. She dug into her purse and brought out a perfumed mulch of face tissues, bobby pins and cash. Here, she panted. It's yours. And there's more where that came from if you keep your mouth shut. She stuffed it into his trousers pocket. She looked at him fiercely, then fled into the street. Paul ran back into his apartment, jumped into bed and pulled the covers up over his head. In the hot, dark cave of the bed, he cried because he and all night Sam had helped to kill a man. A policeman came clumping into the house very soon and he knocked on both apartment doors with his billy club. Numb Paul crept out of the hot, dark cave and answered the door. Just as he did, the door across the hall opened and there stood Mr. Hager, haggard but whole. Yes, sir, said Hager. He was a small, balding man with a hairline moustache. Can I help you? The neighbors heard some shots, said the policeman. Really? said Hager urbanely. He dampened his moustache with the tip of his little finger. How bizarre. I heard nothing. He looked at Paul sharply. Have you been playing with your father's guns again, young man? Oh, no, sir, said Paul, horrified. Where are your folks? said the policeman to Paul. At the movies, said Paul. You're all alone, said the policeman. Yes, sir, said Paul. It's an adventure. I'm sorry I said that about the guns, said Hager. I certainly would have heard any shots in this house. The walls are thin as paper and I heard nothing. Paul looked at him gratefully. And you didn't hear any shots either, kid, said the policeman. Before Paul could find an answer, there was a disturbance out on the street. A big motherly woman was getting out of a taxi cab and wailing at the top of her lungs. Lem, lem, baby! She barged into the foyer, a suitcase bumping against her leg and tearing her stockings to shreds. She dropped the suitcase and ran to Hager, throwing her arms around him. I got your message, darling, she said, and I did just what All Night Sam told me to do. I swallowed my self-respect, and here I am. Rose, 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 my little Rose, said Hager. Don't ever leave me again. They grappled with each other affectionately and staggered into their apartment. Oh, just look at this apartment, said Mrs. Hager. Men are just lost without women. As she closed the door, Paul could see that she was awfully pleased with the mess. You sure you didn't hear any shots, said the police meant to Paul. The ball of money in Paul's pocket seemed to swell to the size of a watermelon. Yes, sir, he croaked. The policeman left. Paul shut his apartment door and shuffled into his bedroom and collapsed on the bed. The next voices Paul heard came from his own side of the wall. The voices were sunny, the voices of his mother and father. His mother was singing a nursery rhyme and his father was undressing him. Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son John, piped his mother. When to bed with his stockings on, one shoe off and one shoe on, diddle diddle dumpling my son John. Hi big boy, said his father. You went to sleep with all your clothes on. How's my little adventurer, said his mother. Okay, said Paul sleepily. How was the show? 
If it wasn't for children, honey, said his mother. You would have liked the short subject, though. It was all about bears, cunning little cubs. Paul's father handed her Paul's trousers, and she shook them out and hung them neatly on the back of a chair by the bed. She patted them smooth and felt the ball of money in the pocket. Little boy's pockets, she said, delighted, full of childhood's mysteries, an enchanted frog. A magic pocket knife from a fairy princess? She caressed the lump. He's not a little boy, he's a big boy, said Paul's father. And he's too old to be thinking about fairy princesses. Paul's mother held up her hands. Don't rush it. Don't rush it. When I saw him asleep there, I realized all over again how dreadfully sure childhood is. She reached into the pocket and sighed wistfully. <sighs> little boys are so hard on clothes, especially pockets. She brought out the ball and held it under Paul's nose. Now would you mind telling Mummy what we have here? She said gaily. The ball bloomed like a frowsy chrysanthemum with ones, fives, tens, twenties and lipstick stained Kleenex for petals. And rising from it, befuddling Paul's young mind, was the pungent musk of perfume. Paul's father sniffed the air. What's that smell? He said. Paul's mother rolled her eyes. Taboo, she said. 